Okay, I think we are live. Guys, okay. happy, <laughs> happy Tuesday, everyone. I hope you are doing very, very well. And welcome to Shifts to Success uh, podcast live. And today we are joined by a phenomenal guy who is actually a client of Shifts to Success and also a friend. And he's doing amazing things in basically changing lives in a very remarkable way. Uh, and solving real key meaningful problems in people's lives. Um, he's the founder of A Positive Shift. And without any further ado, Gary Pinion, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So Gary, what I'd like to start off by asking um, people who are on the podcast is, what was it like for you growing up as a kid? Um, you know, was you academic? Where you from? Was you naughty? Oh, crikey. Um, academic, no. Um, <laughs> uh, I was born in Eastbourne, uh, East Sussex. That's where I lived. Um, two younger brothers. Um, just fun. I just remember having fun. Lots of fun. Um, one of those kids, um, we were just out until it, playing until it got dark, um, playing with loads of mates um, until someone took the football home or, or that kind of thing. Um, loads of good memories. Um, I wasn't particularly academic at school, no. Um, in fact, uh, we didn't have to stay on at school in those days. So I left school um, because of my birthday on 31st of August. So I was the youngest in the year. Um, so I left at 15 and um, did my GCSEs and left at 15. Um, having said that, in the, um, I think it was the January or February of that year, I'd already um, applied to and been accepted um, for a job in a bank, in a lot of the local banks. Nice. Uh, irrespective of what GCSE results I got so um, <laughs> yeah it's quite bizarre but um, yeah I literally sat down and my dad said to me about because um, I didn't want to go to college um, uh, I went to the open evening and they said there was like four hours um, plus homework a night and it just wasn't for me it just it just yeah you know, I just didn't sit right and it wasn't something I could see myself doing so my dad said well you have to get a job then so I sat down and wrote to every bank every branch every bank in in Eastbourne and um yeah, I got accepted at two, and that Western Royal Bank of Scotland took Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, and four days after my 16th birthday, I started there. On the, I think I was 16 on the Friday, started on the Monday. And wow. uh, but yeah, that, that summer was um, it was a great summer for me because as I say I literally left school quite early at 15, worked all through the summer, um, and two paper rounds, two hotel jobs, a restaurant uh, job in a restaurant kitchen, um, cleaned a friend's taxi was constantly busy only cash in hand I'd love it great summer great fun and uh, yeah busy busy awesome what so working in a bank what was kind of the pressure there you know what, what kind of jobs were you doing in the bank were you speaking to customers were you counting money or yeah everything um yeah behind behind the counter um the cashier obviously um all the money um and uh you know, speaking to customers from day one it was yeah straight straight in there um and i had to learn and obviously all my colleagues were a lot older so quite a um quite a growing up experience if you like um quite a big learning curve um i i, I have got I haven't got ahead for mass numbers but i, I got ahead for, for remembering numbers mm. uh, so yeah i could remember count numbers sort codes uh, and that later on helped me in the place i could remember um, number plates and stuff quite sadly really but um yeah I was one of those people in the brief and I wouldn't have to write it down because I'd always remember it and they they'd question me whether I've I'd written it down or not I said well no I don't need to write it down and um yeah nice. a bit sad like that but um but yeah I just have one of these funny funny minds remembering weird things but um but yeah it was all customer based customer facing so it was good but yeah wow. straight in from day one in a brand new little suit and stuff <laughs> <laughs> amazing okay so you, so you say you're 15 at this point I would have just literally turned 16. I was, I was 16. 16 on the Friday, started work on the Monday. Wow, okay. And how long do you stay in that, that bank job for? Oh, um, so I was 16, I was, I was there for four years. Um, and then I left there and then I joined um, a private um, patient span. It's was called PPP, which is now um, AXA, um, right. insurance company, which again, it was in the town, big employer in the town. Um, and I was there for uh, another four years, so literally so eight years um, when I left school was in office jobs and office kind of related jobs. Um, that's before I left and joined the police. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and, and why the police? What, what appealed you? Obviously, you've been banking and then insurance. And then why 
Why the police? What what intrigued you about that? Well, Alex, I can't really give you a big story about my whole family being police orientated, <laughs> me being a boyhood dream or anything. I, 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 I can't, I'm afraid. Um, I, I've done eight years in in those kind of office based jobs. My, my, I knew what I was doing. I could do kind of do the jobs with greatest respect, stand on you know on my head kind of thing, and I knew what those they were inside out. Um, a friend joined the police, and uh, he was clearly having a good time. I I, I genuinely, uh, you know, it was. 1998, I don't know, yeah, and uh, I had no idea what the police was about. Never, no one in our family or, or friends, etc., were in the police. Never been involved with police, which is a good thing. You know? And um, <laughs> I, I, he enjoyed it. He said, "Come back." I said, "It's really good. It's variety. It's you know, it's you no know, one day is the same." I thought, "Well, that sounds good to me. I'll have a bit of that." I went to apply. Um, got a pay rise at work, and I thought, "Now I'll stay here. This is easier, isn't it?" You know, whatever you know, and all that. The pay rise didn't really come to it as much as I thought, and um, I regretted not applying. And so in the December that year, I applied again. And then one thing led to another, and I was in. And wow. <laughs> I had to, uh, yeah, and there was, uh, there was no big story to it. I just uh, I thought, well, let's give this a go. It sounded good from, you know, from my friend's perspective. And it, it was, uh, yeah, it was the challenge. I guess I kind of needed and wanted at that stage of life as well. Wow. Amazing stuff. And, you know, going into the police, how long was you in the police in total? Sorry. Uh, 15 years. So in 15 years, what kind of roles did you do um, throughout that, throughout that career? Um, predominantly uniform, um, PC and towards the, sort of the end, um, bits and pieces of acting sergeant, um, some tutoring, um, worked on a sexual exploitation team, some licensing work, but predominantly uniform. That's what I enjoyed the most. That's what I got the buzz out of. That's what that was that was me really yeah that, that was where I, I got the most um yeah enjoyment out of I guess it is, a, is the right word mm. uh, and and that's what I saw myself doing I didn't really see myself coming off and doing anything other than that and uh, yeah I would, the vast majority of what I did was was uniform based wow okay awesome stuff um so obviously now you're in business um how first of all how did that come about and why not just stay in the police until the retirement well, I'd, yeah, it's a yeah. <laughs> I've left the police, um, and I left the police, um, and it, after I left, it became apparent that um, I had one or two sort of um, issues that I'd unresolved, men mentally, health wise, um, and uh, I didn't think that they could be resolved. I thought it was just one of those things. It was part of the job, so to speak, um, and I would just kind of carry them around with me forever, almost. Um, and it wasn't till 2015, um, which was two, just over two years after I'd left, um, that I came across uh, an opportunity to resolve those. Um, and those put into context in 2015, um, the actual sort of the catalyst for them happened in 2007, if that makes sense. So it was eight, so it was eight years later, um, I'd sort of been carried around, not just the incident that happened, which was a, um, a, a Pollack, um, a, a police car crash, a car crash on duty in 2007, and not just that, but a number of other incidents which had obviously been, um, yeah, unleashed, I guess, um, as a result of that. And so eight years later, um, I came across an opportunity um, where a lady helped me um, through some therapy, um, and it was all quite accidental, really. She was, you know, it was on a course, and she offered um, the opportunity to deal um, with any sort of flashbacks or intrusive memories and people that people were having or someone was having. So I kind of volunteered uh, um, as a friend of hers um, and had my sort of sceptical sort of ex-police head on thinking, you know, I'll just do it as a, but it worked, you know, and it worked and it wasn't until then I thought, actually, if it, this works for me, I really hadn't had um, any great involvement in sort of mental health or awareness or, um, other than the people I've helped through work, if that makes sense, through, through the police, mm. um, and, and um, with the greatest respect, that you know they were the extreme to where you know, to where I was. Um, so I didn't really even probably even equate myself to having mental health um, or mental health um, illness. For one, I know we all have mental health, but mental health uh, illness, I guess. So yeah, it wasn't until um, until then that I actually sort of put two and two together, I guess, and thought, well, actually, if I can take what I've learned from this, um, could I actually use that to help other people within the emergency services? Um, and, and they don't need to suffer in the way that I had for eight years. Um, 
yeah, so then that, that's it kind of sort of evolved from there, if I'm honest, yeah. And it, it didn't even sort of register until after that, that it could be, it was a business or could be a business. Um, and since then it's, it's kind of, um, yeah, it, it's moved on further and further and um, it's just gathered pace. It's <laughs> wow, okay, awesome. So obviously you've had an experience in the job. You thought that the, the problems that you were dealing with with mental health wise, that they couldn't be fixed. They just, as you go, this is something you've got to live with until... You know, you grow very, very old and pass away, right? Something part of your life now. Yeah. And then you go to therapy and um, with your skeptical head on and you realize you're just going to go for it. And with the moment when this all started to click in place and, you know, things started to work for you and, you know, you're feeling better about your own thoughts and your own mental health. How did that feel? Because a lot of people who are in the public sector or, or the police or, you know, emergency services, I've heard that before. They feel like they've just got to get on and deal with it. For you, eight years feeling that way, knowing that, oh, hang on, I feel better. How did how, that feel? It felt tremendous to know that I didn't have to or wasn't thinking about that thing um, every day and it wasn't such at the forefront of my mind anymore. It just felt amazing. Um, and it wasn't so, you know, the fact that it was eight years old and I was still thinking about it on a daily basis, um, you know, it's just incredible to actually be able to put that behind me and put it where it should be eight years ago, you know, and, and I could actually sort of move on and be myself again. Mm. Okay. And what kind of things did she do with you? Did she like hypnotize you? Did she, you know, no, she didn't. Of... No, no, it was um, at the time it was a sort of relatively new, new technique that was being used here. Um, it was something by, um, this is by Paul McKenna and um, some, some brothers from America that have invented it and um, come out with it. And it was used, I mean, he's used it, I know, um, with people in um, from the 7-7 bombings of police officers and pits and police like that and other emergency service workers. And it was something that we, should, you know, we worked on. It's a, it's a therapy called Havening. And that's what she used with me to, to see how, you know, the flashbacks I was having from the car crash and bits and pieces like that. So it's... Um, like like all of the stuff I do, that particularly um, intrigued me because it was content free. And as much as what that means is I didn't have to talk about the content of the actual incident and event. Um, it was enough for me to say um, or to know what it was or for me to say, listen, it's just a car crash. And that's all I, that's all I needed to say, and because I could quite happily and quite well, not happily is not the right phrase, but I could quite easily take myself back there and know what that was without having to discuss every detail. And, and go into the whys and wherefores of what happened. So, um, and, and having had some counselling in the past, which took me back constantly to where I, I had been with the car crash uh, and didn't put me in a good place every time, and didn't help me move forward, this, particularly, um, this particular method intrigued me. And, and everything I do now is, is content free because I don't want to re-traumatise people. Um, mm. do, you, do you feel that, you know, because obviously, you know, content free... Do you feel like there's a lot of therapists out there who maybe aren't content free and it causes distress because they've bring up these stories that they've been through, which is causing the trauma in the first place? Um, that's a difficult one to say. But obviously, every, every therapist is different and I, and I can't account for how they do and don't, don't deal with it. My own personal view is that, you know, when it comes to trauma as well, um, you can't necessarily talk trauma out of the body. There is other methods you need to explore, other methods you need to look into. Mm there is an aspect whereby I think you, there is a fine line between re-traumatizing people through, through over-talking it and, mm. and over, going over those incidents. Um, it's, it's down to the individual what, what works for them. Yeah, of course. Okay. And, and havening, I've never heard that before in my life. Can you mm. give me an example of, of havening? It's, uh, of course, what's called a psychosensory sensory therapy. And it's about... Um, rubbing of the rubbing of the arms essentially okay. uh, and uh and, and talking about um kind of a distraction technique as well you know i get, get you to think of what's happened and then we talk and then we talk about different things and it's a distraction technique um wow. and it's yeah it's something where you need to probably experience rather than sort of just show you as a, as a one-off now without some some kind of context to it but yeah but yeah it's, it's so plenty of videos that can um, share. Paul McKenna's done lots of work, but it's, it's really impactful as well. And again, it's, uh, it's content free because um, there's no need to sort of go into great detail about it. Wow, awesome stuff. Okay, um, and because of how you felt, obviously, and mm. that this this amazing therapist helps you, obviously that gave you that insight that 
you'd love to pass this on to potential people who have got trauma in their lives and going through certain situations. I'm assuming that's where the I, the business kind of started to shape, take form, right? Yeah, it started to evolve because obviously, you know, um, other therapies, um, once you start to sort of look at, learn some things, other therapies become, to, come to the fore as well. Um, and uh, I, I've looked at hypnotherapy, I've learned, learned how to do hypnotherapy um, and um, some other bits and pieces which have become really effective and uh, using those with people has, you know, has been incredible and seen some amazing results. The, the, the go-to kind of therapy I use now is what's something called uh, IEMT, which is Integral Eye Movement Therapy. Okay. It's an eye, it's an eye movement therapy, as it says, as it says really. Um, and, and it's about moving people's eyes. And when the person's eyes deviate, that kind of internal representation, representation is changed of memories that they have. Um, so, for example, sort of nice, well, maybe we're going off course here on a bit of a tangent, but nice, mem yeah. nice memories and traumatic memories are stored differently. Okay. And nice memories have a, a, a timestamp and generally a picture with some emotion. Uh, traumatic memories tend not to have a timestamp and, and they're much richer in their details uh, and they're, they tend to be a movie, and very subjective. Um, and they tend to get you know, stuck, if, if you want a better phrase, and people struggle to process them. And, and um, when, when I talk to people about memories, um, and we talked about you know, how vivid that memory is, like, or you know, now people say, oh yeah, well, it's like it happened yesterday, or it's like it's happening now. And yet, um, although you know, my, my particular incident was eight years ago, I would say the vast majority of people I deal with, um, are, you know, it's double figures, it's you know, 10, 10 plus years ago, we're talking of sort of traumatic instance um, that they're, they're still recalling and carrying around and very much at the forefront of their mind there. And it's all sort of quite, um, almost HD sort of cinema, you know, cinema sort of there and um, they can see all the action and what's happening there then for them still, even though it's, you know, it's quite historic. So wow. it's, a, it's a really good way of, um, and by deviating the eyes and talking, you know, talking briefly and asking them some relevant questions, it's, it's a great way to release that memory and release the emotions that are attached to them as well. It helps file it back where it needs to be. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, who is your typical customer like? Obviously, there's a lot of people in the world who have had some kind of trauma or stress or anxiety. Um, who do you typically work with, or, or, or have you found like a, a particular niche or anything like that? Yeah, well, with a positive shift, I'm typically working with emergency service workers, um, police, firemen, um, and paramedics. And uh, I've worked with some, NH some NHS staff too. Um, and more recently, I'm working with some military officers um, who, are, who have been struggling with um, with memories and flashbacks that they've they've uh, they've had too. So, I, across those spectrums, I would say more than anything. Mm. Okay, and, and is that be because they are exposed to certain situations due to the nature of their jobs, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, and, and what kind of obviously we talked about trauma. What kind of other problems do your customers come to you with is it like stress management anxiety or yeah so they're all interlinked really um ptsd trauma um stress and anxiety yeah so they're all, they're all interlinked and um they're all anxiety related issues and um yeah unwanted memories of intrusive thoughts and uh, yeah the, the flashbacks kind of scenario um and, and just generally um struggling from not having processed significant incidents or you know traumatic incidents not having processed them really and then realizing now that you know the effect that they're having on, on their life and not just their lives but obviously the significant others and their you know, their friends and family and, and colleagues as well so mm. yeah wow okay and what have you found a what's the probably the correct word to say have you found more of a common trend with a particular job like the police have you found more that there's more trauma or ptsd or more anxiety with a different sector or is it just random um i would say predominantly the police it's um yeah very trauma related very trauma related i mean i know there's, there's stats been um released about um you know how many incidents in a sort of career lifetime um it's suggested that they they, they attend you know, think between four and six hundred i'd almost probably dispute that and say it's you know that, that figure is way too low um you know four to six hundred in, in, in a career I, I would suggest that <laughs> you could probably attend that in a year in some cases 
Wow. You know, and, and um, when you're building those up and up and up, and um, I think, you know, the, the thing is, when you're literally going from job to job to job, you don't have a respite in between to acknowledge what's happened or, or to debrief what's happened properly to, you know, effectively. Um, and, and you rest days and you come back in and, and, and it's not really been processed. So um, it's, it's huge, really. And that, that trauma just adds up. And it doesn't have to be huge events. It's just that accumulation, you know, constant accumulation of things. Uh, and then, like, like I said before, um, I'm quite open about the fact that, you know, the car crash, well, you know, whilst it was, for me, it you know, was not a pleasant situation. Um, and, you know, for everyone involved, you know, fortunately, you know, no one was badly injured. And yeah, it wasn't the worst thing I ever attended in the police. Mm. Um, but it was probably that, that, that thing that, um, that popped the lid on everything else, you know. Right. And it was that, you know, that particular, you know, situation um, what was, you know, was the final straw, if you like, you know, and I can reflect back now and think of other things were probably in the, you know, the grand scheme of things of my general safety and everything else um, were a lot, lot worse, you know. Um, but that, you know, that, 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 that was the one, I guess. That, you know, that... That's interesting. So what you're saying here is that through the, tr- through the people, what well, through the things that people experience due to the nature of their jobs, due to incidents or uh, personal injuries they go through or, any situation they go through in the job, it might not happen the first time that they start to have effects of trauma or PTSD or anxiety or stress, et cetera. It, it accumulates, it adds on top of each other, right? Yeah, and yeah. that comes to a, a boiling point where essentially something will pop yeah. uh, and that can come out in certain behaviors that that individual might go through. Yeah, a boiling point is a great, you know, you know a great picture of it because, you know, it's just up until then, it's probably just simmering near the top and then it just, something else you just keep pouring more stuff in and eventually it's just gonna, it's going to bubble over isn't it right and, and unless we empty that thing out empty that pot out on a regular basis through work through therapy or you know or through, through general support mm. it's, it's just not going to happen it's going to bubble over and that's when people start to break and people start to struggle wow what going on to the struggle side of things and, and the behaviors that people that you can experience obviously don't share any names i know you wouldn't anyway but what kind of behaviors would a person have and the reason I want to ask that question is because sometimes I'm assuming that people may not realize they have the behaviors and they're just on autopilot, right? So for example, is it nightmares? Is it getting really anxious about a certain thing they have to do on a day-to-day basis? Is it a temper? Is it crying? You know, what kind of behaviors come out due to trauma that people go through? Yeah, listen, all of that, all of that, all of the above and more. Yeah, I mean, nightmares are you know, a constant thing. Um, sl- you know, sleeplessness as a result of like, nightmares as well. Wow, okay. um, obviously, people working on shift you know, is, a, is a big, can be a big impact to that. Um, but just hypervigilance about things. Um, yeah, almost like a paranoia? Yeah, to a degree, I guess, yeah. I mean, yeah. but there's also, when it comes to trauma, there can be an avoidance of situations. There can be avoidance of people, um, of um, potentially instances that, you know, that may cause a flare-up of you know of, of the situation again it is a you know it can be a big avoidance but um yeah temper having a, a, you know um getting angry at issues having a short temper short fuse um anxiety is a, you know a big thing catastrophizing about things you know that, that, that could happen in the future again right so like worrying about or making things bigger than it is is that what you mean by that yeah yeah big, you know, what if scenarios what if, what if's a big you know a big thing what if this happens what if that happens you know if people, and that kind of thing you know that snowballs massively you know and and obviously you know all of our memories are based on experience aren't they so you know when we go in situations with you know we're thinking oh, well actually that happened last time what if this happens again and what if that happens and, and yeah it's, it can be a huge catastrophizing situation wow wow okay when, it, when a client comes to you with a particular problem they're going through, wh- wh- wherever it might may be, how, how do you, because it's quite easy to say I feel better, right? How do you, do you, do you, how do you measure, you know, their success as a result of going through you? Do you have like a process that you work with them through or? Yeah, we, a lot of this, the work is scaling. We scale it from one to 10. Yeah. Um, right. and, and you know, there's, there's quite a basic method, but it's a really effective, you know. Yeah. And where, where do you sit in regards to that particular situation with 10 being, you know, being the absolute worst for you, mm. and one being, you know, I'm okay with it, you know, where, where are you right now? 
and, and, and when people are, you know, before we start the kind of therapy, if you wish, I mean, if people are at the top, top end of nine, 10, um, as we go through it, we'll continue to scale and we'll continue to, you know, to, to calibrate it throughout and see and see where they're at. And obviously we're looking to get them to, you know, to a, a low point of somewhere where they're comfortable. Not everyone's going to get down to a one, um, but uh, somewhere where they're more comfortable with the actual, you know, the, the memory um, or the actual sort of trauma which we're working with. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, with regards to people who, you know, maybe go through certain trauma or anxiety, et cetera, a knock on confidence can start to develop. They may not feel as confident to go for a particular job or may not confident in a particular role or just about life in general. You know, I know there's people who have, you know, come to shift success and they're wanting to go into business, but because of the situations happening in the job, they just feel a lack of confidence for you and the problems you solve. How can you, if I came to you on confident, how, how can you help or what kind of advice can you help or give to help me become more confident, should I say? I think dealing with the trauma itself mm. has a knock-on effect on people's confidence. Mm. So dealing with that issue they've been carrying around and, and like I say, the wider um, impact of that that it has on their life, whether it stops them from going out socially, with, you know, whatever that stops them from doing, once we deal with that, that in itself creates confidence that they can, can start going to do those things again. Um, whether it be speaking to people, going out and doing things. So, you know, that in itself is positive. My, my general advice, you know, we, also, we talk about, you know, I did a video recently uh, on my Facebook page about listening, challenge, challenging and changing your thoughts uh, and paying attention to and listening to what you're saying internally uh, and, and also particularly externally um, because our, our language is important to us and it affects us. And I, I, we don't always kind of realise the... Um, the spoken word is 10 times more powerful than the unspoken word. Mm. And our words broadcast our beliefs to ourselves and to the world around us. Mm. So I think that that's very important that people learn that and it's got kind of educated about that as well. And that can breed confidence. If people always say, I can't do this, I can't do that, this isn't possible. Mm. It's about actually just trying to re-educate them in, in that respect. And I think it's about listening closely to, you know, to those words and, and considering <laughs> the impact and, and just changing them where appropriate, because that in itself leads, you know, leads to a little bit of confidence. And everybody's confidence is, you know, obviously it's subjective to them, isn't it, as well? Yep. Um, and just taking small steps, I would say. I think, I think within the police, we, you know, we used to be in problem solvers, and we, you know, we, we're going to step in and change, you know, and save everybody, and, and, and take everybody from straight from A to Z. And we've done all, you know, we, it's all down to us. I think we need to go, you know, actually just slow down A to B to C and just do it slowly a bit at a time and just take your time, I think, because um, I think sometimes we can, all of us, be guilty of trying to do too much too soon. Mm, absolutely. So, so what you're saying there, like affirmation, how you speak. So I, I you know, I sometimes tell people with the self-depreciating humor, right? People say, oh, I'm so crap with money or, you know, I'm, I'm really, oh, I'm really, uh, I'm really rubbish at that, whatever that, that may be, right? In a jokey way, but that has actually some power to what they're actually telling their subconscious, right? They are, yeah, yeah. there's a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. And, and uh, obviously the, you know, I'm called a positive shift and, and very much I always try to place people about being positive and, you know, do this positively, say that positively. And sometimes, I get that that can, that can be a struggle for people and, and almost um, being more positive can be intimidating for some people because I just don't know how to be more mm. positive. I can't be positive like you sometimes, you know. Mm. And, and so even just being less negative is easier. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. being less negative about what you say and what you do, just do that, starters. Like and baby steps, less, right? Yeah, and being less negative is, is much easier to start with. Amazing. And you'll find that will make you positive anyway. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I want to talk on stress now. Um, it's no surprise for those who listen to the podcast who have you know been following me for a while that the the public sector as a whole, um, start off in the police service, uh, is a very stressful job to have due to things that you've got to deal with in that in that job. Um, what techniques can you give to help someone reduce stress? Right, because stress is a big killer in itself. But how can you you know maybe help someone who's watching this or hearing this and they've got stress going on in their lives and they really need to take control of that before something bad happens yeah again stress for me is, is, is again it's subjective person to person but why it would be stressed by it would be different to what you would be 
And I think it just varies. It's about managing it and recognising it, I think, first of all. Um, I never recognised the stress I was under. I never recognised it until it was too late. And I think um, if I was to go back now, I'd be a totally different person. And I would, you know, the recognition would be, would be huge and much, much different. Um, I think, for me, routine is good. Routine is really key. Um, having a routine on a daily basis um, is, is, is important, Have, having some kind of a structure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, taking time out, I think, for ourselves, um, daily or weekly, giving yourselves um, you know, a daily or weekly happy hour where you just take time out for you to unwind, and exercise, read, walk in nature, whatever's good for you for that hour. Mm. Uh, so whether you're that fits in, you know, uh, I know yourself, you like to play golf, don't you? So well, that's, uh, <laughs> I do. It causes more stress sometimes. Uh, well, right? yeah. <laughs> that's potential. But um, just do something for yourself. Uh, uh, there's breathing techniques, you know, and um, breathing techniques, I think, are really useful as well, just to slow your stress down and um, stand back and, and see what's going on. Some, there's some techniques I've put on my de- on website, which you can download um, totally free and, and use them and and... and they're great. I think, you know, it wasn't something for me I realised until actually we sit back and realise how you know, useful and how powerful just a simple thing like a breathing technique can be. Mm, amazing. Um, something you don't think of, really, because for me at least, I've never thought about breathing, but I know there's a lot of people who use the breathing techniques and it obviously works well for them. Um, yeah. With regard, is that just like holding your breath for a minute and then stopping or, or, or what do you do? Hyperventilate? No, no, please don't. No. <laughs> now, there's two different techniques on there. There's one of them is my favourite one. is It's called the colour breathing. Uh, and uh, it's about breathing um, in a really positive colour and breathing out a negative colour. And uh, you can ah. do it for 60 seconds. Uh, you do it any way you like because you are simply breathing. No one knows what you're doing. No one knows you're doing anything sort of um, extra. But um, you do it in the car, on the golf course if you wanted. Wow. Um, and I say <laughs> if you have a negative view of something, something's frustrating you. It doesn't have to be massive, but you know how big or small it can be. But just associate that negative feeling with a with a colour, and the, and give it the opposite positive colour, and breathe in the positive and breathe out the negative. Wow! So, Someone would pick that colour, whatever that may be to them. Yeah, totally down to you. There's no right or wrong colour. It's uh, yeah, down to you. Right. Okay. Interesting. Um, how can someone better deal with anxiety? So anxiety is a big big problem. I think I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but a large percentage of people have anxiety uh, and probably before you answer that question actually is anxiety normal if if we didn't have anxiety in some way would that be a bigger issue or what are your thoughts on that um yeah anxiety is perfectly normal i had anxiety coming on here <laughs> yeah. i've got a little bit it's got it's got less than now that you know, the more we talk has got better but um yeah it, it's perfectly natural we will have it um and um if we didn't if we didn't have it i wouldn't be here Mm. because you know I will, you wouldn't have invited me and I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have accepted it mm. um but it's just about different levels of it isn't it and how we cope with those different levels um I, I'm running an anxiety awareness workshop which people are you know, happy to big people want to message me I'm happy to invite them onto that and send them the link for it um and I think sometimes it's for me it's about um kind of refer to the seesaw effect you know you can it, you stand if you stand on the middle of the seesaw you can balance it out and balance both both sides but if you, you know, think about anxiety, something that happens in the future and you sort of start to tip one way and you get out of balance and you start to sort of think about the future and what's happening and what could happen and, and you start to sort of get a bit out of kilter. Mm. You come back to the middle and sort of stay, in fact, stay focused on the now, where we are now, and then, then start to, to look at it and start to move forwards from there. But there's, again, there's loads of techniques that you can provide, um, loads of little bits and tips and, and grounding in information and, and uh mindset attitudes but um yeah we've all got anxiety um and uh yeah it's a perfectly natural thing to have yeah i think the way i look at it as well if you haven't got anxiety it's like you don't care probably about an outcome maybe like for me like you know if i've got anxiety about me performing on the golf course as an example right yeah. um and the anxiety yes it may be a bit bad or teen up in front of someone and me just missing my shot but if I didn't have the anxiety, it may not encourage me to perform as best I can because yeah. I just don't care as much. So that's kind of a flip on the head. And also something that's helped me is instead of thinking of all the things that go wrong, which we typically do as humans, start thinking of all the things that can go right. Or what if this happens and that happens, mm. um, which can happen, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think as, as I said about touching the video I did earlier about um, sort of listening, challenging, change, and changing. Um, it's all just, I think, just to take into account 
you can only ever think of one thing at a time. So mm. you can only ever have just one thought. So if that one thought is negative, mm. you, you, let me try it. You can't think of two things at once, can you? No. <laughs> so I like to. Yeah. So if that one thought is negative, if you make the next thought a positive, you're no longer thinking about the negative. Mm. If, if the negative thing that you're thinking about, you then think more about it and you, and you think another thought about it, you're only going to help that grow. Mm. So if you then change that negative thought and think, I'm going to think something positive, like you say, actually, I'm going to, I am going to tee off properly. I am going to tee off okay. Mm. Everything is going to go okay. And, and that's your next positive thought and your next one, your next one. Mm. And that, that, that itself makes a big difference, just to focus on that thought. What are your thoughts on visualization, Gary? Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I think it's great. Yeah. I, th- I think it's a really positive um, attribute to have and to use. Yeah. Awesome. And what about my kind of meditation? Do you, is that because I, I personally find it very, very hard to meditate? I, I feel like I can't shut off. What are your thoughts on meditation? I can't sit still long enough for it as yet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's not really um, something that's worked for me. Um, I appreciate that, you know, it's, it's something that sits well with a lot of people. I'm more of an exercise kind of person. I'll, I'll get out there and I'll go for a run or, or you know, um, a good a good walk. But um, yeah, it's, it's not something that um, uh, I've been able to sit look still long enough yet and switch off for. So um, no, mm. I'm with you on that. But um, I, I understand it's got massive benefits. So yeah. Awesome. Um, so I've saw one of your clients, a testimonial, yeah. uh, from one of your clients. Uh, I actually got emotional watching that because, uh, you know, you'd really changed his life. He had been through a situation, you had helped him. Uh, do you want to explain and give some context to, to that story? Cause I think people listening would benefit from it because, you know, if they're having the same issue, well, this can be fixed. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a wonderful testimonial and, um, it was a video testimonial that Matt was kind enough to do for me and we were working together and talking like we, we are now. And um, we got to the end of the session and, and he said, I mean, he was, as you, as you saw, quite emotional. And, um, and he said, oh, I'm so chuffed. I, I really want to sort of give you something back. I'd like to record something for you. And I was, and um, took me by surprise a little bit, but we pressed the cord and, and what you, what you saw was literally quite raw as to you know, what he said. And um, Matt was a, he was a fireman. And in 1999, he went to a, a again, I don't know too much context to this. I can't really tell you much more than what, what he, he went to an incident in 1999. And I think it was Valentine's Day um, and it involved the death of someone. That, that, that's literally all I know. And, and, yeah. um, and then as a result, in, in, in the, uh, the years, the following years, um, he, he developed PTSD. Uh, and he struggled with the memories of that and because it was outside a, a school as well somewhere and then um, somewhere where he knew from where he lived um so somewhere he saw quite regularly um we did the work together online and to work together um, we used the eye movement therapy and um yeah as you saw it, it still gives me goosebumps to watch um, mm. and yeah it was um, I, he speaks to me now and again he messages me now and again and um He's in such a great place, he's, you know, and then to hear someone say, he's like, and get a message from saying, you know, you, you've literally changed my world, you've changed my life, is just <laughs> incredible, really. You know, it's, 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 it's a massive high, and it's a real bu- I get a real buzz from it, but I'm, I'm, I'm so chuffed for him because, you know, you can see, physic- you can visibly see, you talk about um, how do you assess your customers, how, you know, how do you know? <laughs> Um, yeah. if they've got better what how do you tell your client success well it is theirs isn't it it's yeah. right there yeah it's it's so evident to see and um i was you know massively grateful to matt for coming on and, and doing that and uh yeah it's mm-hmm. it's amazing it is amazing very amazing guys i highly recommend you go and check that out because it's uh it's actually mind-blowing um yeah. with regards to um the police i want to talk about the police because that's where we're both from i was a do he was a cop um What's going on with the police in the sense of the more, the more, the bigger shift success grows, the more conversation I'm having with people who have got some type of trauma, PTSD, something's happened. Right. And I'm thinking, where's the support for cops in relation to their jobs and the things they have to go through? Um, I just feel like there's a lack of support. I don't know your thoughts on that, or is it due to funding? Was it due to budget cuts? I don't know, but I just feel like there's not enough what are your thoughts it doesn't seem to be enough no um having said that 
there's much much more awareness of it than there ever was when you know I joined and and throughout my career um which is obviously good um but I still don't think it was enough you know I speak like as you know as you do I speak to people on, you know on a regular basis and it's just there just isn't that support there I don't mm. think um and there just isn't enough um I don't think there's enough recognition of the you know the actual incidents that people are attending um and the perception that people have when they go to incidents it's like you know a whole section of us could go to the same instant we could all see it and, and interpret it differently it doesn't mean say because we've all gone to it and come away from it they're all okay mm. um and like i said my thing's built up over years you know but other people's can can build up over a short period of time and, and it's uh i just don't think there's, an, there's enough knowledge and awareness within the police to be able to deal with it either um i don't think that again i was offered counseling and that was a long long time ago I don't think I've got no issues with counselling and it, I think it's got its place, but I think there should be a wider variety of options to people because there's not, you know, there's no silver bullet to every therapy, not, you know, one therapy doesn't suit all. So I think there should be a wider variety of options open to people mm. before they say you, you are okay or you're not okay. You've only just tried this, this and this, or you've just done, you know, one thing. There's a lot of people I speak to now who are just being sent emails with links to websites or links to various stuff and just say, well, go have a look at that and come back to us when you look to this. And mm. I just don't think it's acceptable, you know, considering what they go through and what they're doing. Um, I agree. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I hear some sad stories, if I'm honest, not just from the police, but yeah, we you know, obviously that's where we sit at. But um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Um, do you feel like, Sometimes because, you know, whether you're a nurse, a doctor, you know, um, in the police, um, whatever job role people are in, that they almost want to mask it and not let people know that they've got these issues. And that's why they carry it for so long without seeing anyone, because it may, they're worried about it may affect their role or their career, etc. Do you feel like people don't speak up as much, may obviously a lot more now because we're aware of it, but do you feel like there's still that stigma around issues that are going on 100 percent, yeah 100 percent, yeah mm -hmm. and I, I get that um yeah I, I get that people why people don't speak up I, I understand that they don't people tell me they don't want to speak up they don't want to be they don't want to be um sidelined into a different kind of job um they don't want to put on um restricted duties they don't want to be um yeah, not work all together at all. We talk about routine. I think sometimes one of the worst thing you can do is actually send someone home and say, you know, and then they're at home with no routine, going from, you know, going from, you know, a shift work or or being in an office with colleagues and stuff around you to support mm. you to a degree, to being at home and having no control and no support, um, other than you know the occasional phone call or visit, you know, now and again. But um, yeah, I. I I, I do think there is a, a concern about people still putting their head above the parapet, especially in some particular roles um, and, and uh, saying that I'm struggling. Um, because you get, you know, you, you can get, say, prior arms, for example, they take, you know, they take the ticket off of them for that. Drivers, they take the ticket off you. And I guess I, I understand, I understand it has to be done with, you know, there is, a, there is a balance to it. But I still think there is um, that stigma is still mm. there, it's still mm. there. Mm. Um, so you've been a cop for many, many years. Now you're in business. And for those who are thinking and those who are generally unhappy with the job, they are just in it for maybe the pension or the salary and they're thinking about going into business, but they're still scared or a bit fearful of going into business. And they feel like they haven't got these skill sets because they're institutionalized. For you personally, Gary, what kind of skill sets do you believe you've transferred from being a police officer into your own business? Um. Given what I do, I've got that lived experience that people can refer to and relate to, mm -hmm. um, which I think is very, very useful given you know the, the people I, I, I speak to. Um, that empathy, that listening skills is really important. Really important. I think listening is, is a, a very much underrated thing. Mm. Um, I'm happy to challenge negativity mm. and, and, um, and just challenge people's behaviour. Um, I, I think it gives you resilience. Um, and it gives you that sort of um, skill set of seeing a job through and, and, and being 
and doing something, you know, even if things don't work out along the way, um, yeah. which can happen with business, can't it? And, you know, it's, it's, you know, life isn't built in straight lines, is it? And it not, it's, it's, it's constant up and down and, uh, and it gives you that resilience to know that actually, you know, we can keep, you can keep going and um, things will turn out all right. Yeah. So I think they've all been useful, useful traits to bring across unknowingly but um yeah that once i started to reflect on them and, and realize i had those traits i think you, you kind of just build up those traits without realizing you have them i think if, I, if that makes sense yeah because you use them so often as human right yeah wow okay and, and you know from you being a police officer to now be in business what kind of mindset differences have you experienced at all um i think just just more focused, I think, more than anything. Yeah, I think it's just more focused on that on the business aspect, um, more focused to move forward and, and constantly achieving and recognizing that those kind of small wins, which is obviously which you know shifts to success has helped me help me do. Um, you know, the support from yourself, the other mentors, um, and the group in general is, is absolutely priceless. Um, I think if I'd have um, carried on wandering, for, you know, <laughs> along my own path, I, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am at now. You know, and I wouldn't be as dare I say it, as professional, if that, if that sounds right. Um, I generally wouldn't have been aware of all the other sort of ideas and opportunities that, that are available to me and, and the kind of bigger picture mm. um, of what, what's, um, what's possible. So, yeah, well, we appreciate that. And, you know, you do the work, you know, we give you the tools and yeah. you're doing the work. So thank yeah. you for putting in the work. Mm. Um, what's kind of i think i'm going to guess this but you know what kind of has been your best entrepreneurial moment so far i mean yes it would be easy to say about matt wouldn't it on the video? it was that's what i was guessing <laughs> the testimony it would, it would be easy and, and yet i mean matt's fantastic because he he, he stepped forward and, and he's, he's done the video and, and that's that takes real you know to be really brave in itself to do that and speak about you know his issues um and I understand and respect everybody I deal with and support and help, but that's not an easy option. And that's not something that people are always comfortable with. And I, I, I get that. So for me, every client's a highlight mm. and uh, as cheesy as that sounds, because it's another person that is free of unwanted memories, intrusive thoughts, past trauma. So every client's a highlight that I can help. Mm. And it's kind of, from I get, yeah, I, I am, you know, <laughs> I do get a buzz out of helping people. And I do get a buzz out of seeing, seeing the difference it makes for people. And so, every, yeah, every client is really is, is my highlight. I mean, so, I know you may mention I've been on the radio and the bits and pieces and that, that yeah, that's nice, you know, and that's, that's really, it's a real nice compliment to be asked to be on the radio um, twice last year to give my views on the stress about policing um, through COVID and just the general sort of stress about uh, and, and the mental health effect on policing. And that was really good. But um, yeah, every client, I would say, is a, is a highlight because everyone's uh, different. And everyone comes with their own you know, situations. And, and uh, I love that because essentially you went into the piece of change and helped lives and you're doing exactly yeah. the same in business, which is amazing. Um, this is probably, I've gone off a tangent a little bit, but and I, I, the more I speak to people about this, it's common that other people do it as well. But sometimes I'll be driving, sometimes I'll be walking along and a memory will pop into my head from 16, maybe 17, could be 21. And just a horrible memory that, that I've been embarrassed about. And I'll cringe like hell. And I'll be like, oh my God, no, I can't believe I said that or I did that. And I don't know what it is, but now and then I'll do it randomly. And I've spoke to people about it, like friends and stuff. And they're like, oh my God, I do the same too. Is there a reason why people do that? It's literally like, it's never, it's obviously there's pleasant memories, but there's also memories like where I'm literally like, oh my God, I cannot believe I did that. Is there a reason for that? Or is that a form of trauma? Although it's very minute, is it, is anything, thoughts on that? Maybe there's a little bit blocking that memory being finally filed for you. Maybe there's a little bit stopping that being blocked for you. But mm. I would say sometimes that happens. Kind of, there could be, you know, those, not a fan of the word, but those triggers sometimes it can be music it can be you know it can be in the car like you say something could just be passing something and something can just trigger that particular memory for you but if as long as it's not something that's constantly there at the forefront of your mind no. causing you issues on a, on a sort of day to day or regular basis I, you know i wouldn't be overly concerned but it's something that could you know it could be dealt with if, it, if it's causing you 
causing you grief, so to speak. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not constantly there. It's just like something I've said whilst I've had a bit of tipple or something, or yeah. I've you know <laughs> done something like a mistake, or I've, I've playing football as a kid and I missed the ball. Just something I'm like, oh no, I can't believe I did that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. just curious to what it is. Um, yeah, okay, cool. With regards to your company and your vision for for where you want to be, Gary, and, and the lives you're impacting, where do you want to take your company? Where where do you see yourself in the next five, seven years? Um, I want a bit of a mission to help 10,000 emergency service workers increase their confidence, well-being and happiness. And I want to take them from PTSD tragedy to a personal triumph, a feeling of that. That's where I want to go. Mm. I want to, that's my aim, 10,000 people. And it's a big aim, I know, but I think I want to take as many there as possible through any support I can provide, whether it's face-to-face or whether it's you know, a wider p- picture of you know, some kind of group work or... However that may be, that's where I see myself going and, and making as big an impact on as many people as possible. Amazing. And, and Gary, to, one of the last questions that you know I like to ask people on, on the show is, for you personally, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Um, it, it means the opportunity to support others when I want to do it and to do what I want to do kind of when I want to do it without those kind of restrictions, without the red tape, without the bureaucracy, without, and how I want to do it. And if, if I want to do it, if I'm honest, you know, um, and not being constricted by others and having that freedom, just freedom is, is everything really. I think freedom of choice. Um, yeah, freedom, the, the whole opportunity to do that. And then that's, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Gary, where can uh, people, reach out to you, um, you know, and contact you in regards to services or even just to have a general chat about how you've made the transition from police officer to entrepreneur. Sure, yeah, I'm on Facebook um, uh, under my, my personal name. You can find a link there, but on, under a positive shift as well. Um, www.apositiveshift.co.uk uh, is my website, which has got the video of Matt on and all the free downloads as well for the breathing. And um, yeah, that, those are probably the best two places to, to contact me. And my phone numbers are on, on both sides. So yeah, feel free to message me at a reasonable time. <laughs> I know what you shift workers are like, so. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing stuff. Gary, thank you so much for your time today. A uh, massive value that you provided for the community. Uh, I know you're doing amazing things inside Shift Success as well and uh, yeah, changing lives, um, which is just a phenomenal mission and uh, vision that you have for yourself. So thank you and keep doing amazing things. Um, and guys, if you've got any questions for Gary following this at all, please do reach out to him. Or if you're watching our our Facebook group, please do comment below. I'm sure Gary will follow up in, uh, in his own time. Um, and guys, we have our next interview, um, I believe later this week with another Shift Success member who is going to be sharing his entrepreneurial journey. In the meantime, guys, I will be seeing you all on the next episode.